Uh, I want to introduce our moderator, Jason Roberts. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, man, so how's the show going for you guys so far, huh? Let's get a round of applause, huh? You guys been to the floor? All right. Awesome. Awesome. This is so good. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I'm happy to be moderating this panel. We're going to talk about modern work and modern workplace, and we're going to get into some of the design aspects and people aspects of modern work. But uh, my name, Jason Roberts. I am the director of the Enterprise AV practice at AVI Systems. And my team and the whole practice teams really focus on taking modern work and providing solutions for today's customers that are asking for solutions to help drive customers back to the workplace. So you saw the Innovation Vault. If you haven't, we're super excited to have you come join us again after lunch. It's gonna be a fun day. So, but enough about me. I have two fantastic guests that are gonna join me today. So please, welcome to the stage, Ryan and Peggy. And Peggy's gonna get all mic'd up here. So we're gonna give Peggy a minute, but Ryan is the VP of Global Insights and Research at Miller Knoll. Yep. Peggy is our director of Alliance, Microsoft Alliance Magenium. So I wanna start with you, Ryan. So when we talk about modern work, we really talk about how the contemporary conversation around modern work is really focused on advancements in technology, insights from people, and where the people and technology meet. And that really that focus of people being the center and centricizing, centervising people with modern work and really kind of building on their experiences, allowing those experiences to kind of blend in. But we've got a chance to spend some time together, Ryan, and I know that you have a wealth of knowledge <laughs> and research that you get. I get. I'm so excited about all the tools he has. It's going to be so fun to hear today. But a question for you is, what really keeps you driving in this industry and what excites you about what you get to do? Sure, um, well hey everyone, great to spend some time with you. Thanks for that question. Uh, the simple answer would be, I think that our work experiences impact our lives in ways that we don't fully realize. So I, I mean, I work for Miller Knoll. We're a company that makes furniture, other spatial things. So when you're describing that intersection of technology and people, I'm also thinking, well, they're in physical environments, whether that's home, office, hospitals, wherever. And what I find really fascinating is how those things come together to either create really great experiences or really lousy experiences. And um, I think most people probably recognize that the planning of technology and specifically audiovisual technology and physical space have been really disconnected for a really long time. We see situations where like interior designers come through, the space is built out, and the space basically is accessorized with audiovisual. And then we've seen the opposite, which is where like space designs are solely focused on the technology and it's just not a natural or enjoyable experience for the people. So I've been doing this 30 years, probably 15 of it has been spent specifically looking at the intersection of technology space and how people work. And um, yeah, I've got a team of global researchers and designers who I get to learn from and uh, the last thing I'll say is we're really fortunate that we've worked extensively with the UX team at Microsoft, with the head of research at Slack, Samsung, Logitech, a lot of tech partners over the years to just try to get our heads around this. I love it, I love it. Peggy, you get a chance. You've been working so much with Microsoft right now. Mm -hmm. And you're really, I would say, um, very fortunate because you get to be the tip of the spear sometimes, and even here sometimes, what Microsoft is doing before any of us else get a chance to hear it. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your role and what you do and kind of what that, that excitement that you get from being able to have that firsthand knowledge that's really getting released and what that impact means for you as you start talking about customers. Sure, thanks. Um, so hi everyone, um, as, as Jason mentioned, my sole role is that I'm working with Microsoft on a daily basis and I'm connecting 
our organization with customers and with Microsoft. So as everyone knows, Microsoft's a large company. It's not always easy to navigate. So I try to help with that and make that navigation much easier. But along with that is, as you mentioned, that opportunity to see all this greatest and latest new technology that's coming out. And so, you know, we can't be at a conference or anywhere and not be talking about AI and how that's impacting. So I'm sure we'll get more into that in um, a, a little bit. But there are so many new things that are coming out that Microsoft has coming out, they're rolling out, that um, is really going to impact what we might now call the connected workplace, right? So how are we connecting people with their flexibility of wherever they want to work, as Keith mentioned earlier in the yep. keynote, and then making all that work seamlessly together. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, you get, my microphone is working, so we don't. <laughs> Good recovery. Yeah, good recovery, right? I'm right. Great, thank you, Peggy. That was amazing. I love how you talk about connecting, and mm -hmm. that's so important. And I think one of the things that we're seeing right now, and we often get a chance to see, is that disconnect that, team, that seems to happen a little bit. Oh, I hope I'm not getting some feedback there. Um, you know, allowing that connection for people to happen and focusing, and you mentioned AI. So tell us a little bit more around when you talk about AI and Microsoft specifically, where do you see that next thing that's happening that's really gonna help people create a better work environment mm -hmm. because of how the tools are available for them that they don't necessarily have today but are really gonna change their workflow and workplace? Sure. So as we know, AI is already improving how we individually work. That's an improvement that many of you, whether you're using Microsoft's Copilot or ChatGBT, many people have experimented with that. But the next big opportunity is AI improving where we work. I like that. So going from that you know, I've got my tools and my individual desktop. Now, how do I take that to where I'm going to be going, which is into my workplace, right? And where my organization is taking me. And so you're going to see that the very simple things right out of the gate is gonna be voice recognition, facial recognition. That is all here, it's already available. What my suggestion would be is, as organizations, don't shy away from it, at least explore it and be at the forefront of it and determine which of these things you do want to roll out and leverage. The other thing that you're gonna see really improve is the camera technology. I mean, it's gonna become so seamless with all the AI and machine learning that's coming to the camera technology where it is just going to recognize you and it is gonna move very seamlessly based on whether you're moving or talking or whatever. So there's so much that's coming. And then the last thing I'll say is there's going to be more that's going to connect the workplace and you and scheduling all that together. I love all that. of that is coming. Um, Microsoft has that rolling out too as we speak. I love that. I love how you talked about um, the connections, the locations. Ryan, we talked about this a little bit and I want you to touch on it. We, I think the, the, the statement that you made to me that I was very intrigued by was it's not just where we work, but it's when we work. And it's now finding that it's not only a balance of hybrid and trying to make sure that we have the good of both, because hybrid can get complicated. Hybrid actually has moments where it might not be great. But you had mentioned that it's not always just about where, but it's also about when. Talk a little bit about, from a design aspect, as this technology starts to really drive forward, what does that mean for designing? Well, that's, that second question is even bigger one. So um, the reason I made that statement, it relates to an initiative that we were a part of called Future Forum. Some of you may have seen it. It was really one of the biggest future of work research efforts during the pandemic. It was Miller Knoll, the head of research at Slack, the head of talent consulting at Boston Consulting Group, and a group called MLT. We, we surveyed 10,000 people every quarter 
about their work patterns, looking at it from technological, spatial, and other kind of facets. And there was so much focus on location flexibility, where, where, where. We actually found that a higher percentage of people were struggling with schedule flexibility. So 81% of the respondents said they wanted more flexibility with where they could work, but 93% said they wanted more, basically control over their calendar. What had happened was that as digital transformation strategies rolled out, the number of meetings, and in particular the number of video meetings increased, and people started to feel as though they couldn't prioritize the most important activities on their calendar because they were a victim to their calendars. And so whether that's working hours across distance for distributed teams, or whether it's just having the ability to say, I need to do this, so I need more control, what it gets to is like this desire for more coordination, which is where I do see AI as playing a really interesting role. If you look at organizations that adopt a hybrid policy, and for what it's worth, we don't think there's such a thing as hybrid work. Like if I send researchers in to study how a team works, nobody's gonna be like, that's hybrid work. That's not hybrid work. It's just like variable demand in terms of who's in the space and who might be distributed. But um, you know, if we look at all the variability with where a team might be located on a given day, it's just made things really complicated. Uh, there was a great episode of The Daily, the New York Times podcast back in January called The Hybrid Worker Malaise, which basically said, okay, like we fought to get more location flexibility, but now when I show up, like, there's not that many people. I can't really find the people that I'm trying to locate. I'm not getting that sp social spark, like the interpersonal exchange that is what physical space is really good at doing. So there's a lot of organizations rethinking the design of their spaces, the integration of technology, um, but also just like the tools to help people find each other, prioritize the work they're doing, and I think that's where a lot of this is gonna, gonna go in the future. Yeah, I love that. So a quick show of hands here. Um, for all of you, I would, I would love to just, I like to get a poll here every once in a while. So a show of hands, has your organization officially announced some, sor some sort of policy? Like, are you a three-two? Do we have any three-twos? Structured hybrid. Structured hybrid, right? Do we have anybody that's um, more demanding or a four-one or a full weekend? Okay. Oh, wow. All right, a couple of them, right? It's still about 49% of organizations. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see um, that percentage is, has its consistency. We're still seeing a lot of not only the where, but it's the when they're working, as you talked about a little bit too. Mm -hmm. So Peggy, when we talk about the next generation of connected people mm -hmm. and AI, um, you also spend a lot of time with just collaboration technologies, right? You talked about camera technology and, and where that's going next. And you get a chance to kind of understand the research model too that Microsoft's driving, are you seeing a growing increase in more of the larger spaces, or are you still seeing organizations as they try to right size, are they, are they looking for diversity in rooms, and what does that mean for some of the solutions that are out there? Sure, so what we're seeing is that um, more and more organizations are, they are redesigning, as Ryan said, they're redesigning the yep. spaces that they have, and you're just seeing so many different spaces, right? Interactive spaces, large spaces, smaller spaces, that isn't changing. And so what you're seeing is, is that people really, really are looking at how do I redesign the space that I have? And then how do I seamlessly make the tech work, right? How does it work where, when I'm, um, wherever I'm working to your point, whether it's hybrid or in your car or wherever, how does that seamlessly work in all of these spaces? And so one of the things Microsoft is doing, the one thing is they're very large, they do eat their own dog food, so they're demoing things on themselves. And one of the new technologies coming out is Microsoft Places. And that's where you're going to see that connectedness come, as you said, that scheduling of people, places, my manager, my team, like what day of the week should I go in if I'm not gonna go in five days a week or three days a week? So I think you're seeing that and I think that you have those large spaces and then your traditional, regular, you know, smaller meeting spaces and yeah, huddle spaces. We still need room for people to come back and do some of that work because they wanna be connected with people. So Ryan, when you're talking and you're meeting with groups and you're, and you're just on this 
design strategy. Mm -hmm. What are some of the lessons learned that you've had over the last maybe just a year or two? Sure. Since the before times. Well, I would say, um, I'll use this picture behind us as an example. The 12 or 14 person conference room, long skinny table, camera at the end is probably the type of space we're seeing used far less. You've got more distributed team members who so are seeing smaller groups. We're also seeing a lot of emphasis on much more natural interaction. So like the bowling alley effect of the remote participant looking down a long table is not desirable. But there's a reason why like telepresence rooms failed where everyone was staring at the screen. So there's a lot of emphasis on let's make spaces that feel more casual, feel a little bit like greater psychological kind of comfort, but still are really video enabled. So we're seeing a little bit of change there. But I'll zoom out and get to an even bigger one, which is I think we're finally seeing, and actually we've been tracking this for more than a decade, that the ways that organizations talk about collaboration is really fractured. So I'm going to stereotype here for a bit, but if I get a chance to talk to the UX team at Microsoft or others within the tech world, collaboration's often been more content-driven collaboration that's asynchronous and distributed. So it's like, if we're going to create a deck, we're not going to go in the same room. Like, somebody's going to open up the file, you'll share it with me, I'll share it with Peggy. Like, the overall process is pretty much individual, heads-down, laptop-based work. But when you talk to people who think about collaboration, particularly with the physical environment, they don't think about that. They're thinking about a bunch of people in a room, co-located at the same time. And uh, the reality is collaboration, it's kind of like the way music is produced these days. Sometimes you get artists going into a studio with a bottle of Jack, but it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot different, right? It's changed. It's multimodal. So we all have to kind of zoom out and say, hey, collaboration's a bunch of different stuff. Sometimes it's casual and it's conversational. Sometimes it's super content rich. One thing we've seen is spaces that overcome the limitations of video. So like being on video for an hour is cool. Trying to do a workshop for three hours on video is really rough. Yeah. So these spaces where you can get in there, make a mess, throw a bunch of stuff up on the wall, still have remote participants. People are loving those kind of project room, war room sort of spaces. But it all kind of begins with this idea of, let's question what I think I'm saying when I say collaboration and recognize that the life of a team has a lot of different moments and we gotta accommodate all of them somewhere. Yeah, I love that. It's, it's, again, I think it's finally the people, the workforce, the knowledge workers, finding their voice, finding that way to be a value to the organization and it's less task driven. And if we can start to build on that and get a community and get consensus around the value that we bring, the opportunities, that desire to go back to the workplace is gonna be around that community. I want to work with others. I have a chance to move the needle, solve big problems together, or just spend time together to hear about the business strategies, the, the things that are going on in the organizations that you sometimes get unknowingly disconnected from when you're remote, that ability to be together and spend that time. If, if it's okay, I'll add on briefly. I, this is one of the, like we talk with a lot of heads of corporate real estate, HR, we work with IT as well, but this shift you just described is for us kind of seismic when it comes to the physical environments. For all of the return to office articles about where people are most productive, most of the, the leaders of organizations that we're talking to are like, I just need these spaces to build a better sense of community. Like our people are all over, if they're gonna come together like this, I mean, some of you probably reconnected with somebody here, gave a high five, gave a hug, whatever. Like these physical spaces are so crucial to creating a sense of belonging. But offices typically were driven by the desires of executives, supervised work, express status. So you can see the process flipping where teams are having a much stronger voice. Organizations are going to teams and just asking like, how you working? How is it different than three years ago? What do you miss? What do, what do you feel like you just can't get done? And um, I think our physical environments are really finally accelerating in their change yeah. for the first time in a really long time because we got Wi-Fi and mobility, what, 2004, 2005? But offices like five years ago pretty much still looked like they did in an era of desktop computing. Bunch of desks, you know, a yeah. bunch of traditional conference rooms. So I guess in that sense there might be a silver lining to everything we've been through, but it's employee driven. It's more participative, it's more inclusive. It's not really so much about what the VP of whatever wants. Well, there is. There's, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And you're right. It's, it's, the, it's the rapid technology shifts. And as we go into rapid technology shifts, uh, Peggy, um, what do you think about, you know, AI is big brother. 
right? There's, there's, there's the, you know, as a friend once said to me, there's a level on the creepy meter, yes. right? That's yes. there. What do you hear as part of how are we trying to help socialize? Y yes, we know it's creepy, but at the same time, it's creating all of these benefits that we believe will really create some great outcomes. What are some of the things that you're hearing to kind of help, I would say, maybe not mitigate it, but soften the blow a little bit of Big Brother over your shoulder? Yeah, you know, I think that that's a really a, a great point because we all, every organization, uh, AI's out there, right? And so there's a study out that 75% of workers are already using AI. Wow. And of that wow. 75%, 78% of them are bringing their own AI to the workplace. So what organizations need to do is they need to at least embrace it and determine what is my AI strategy and get in front of it because you can contain it to your environment, but you need to be on the forefront of that, right? Because people are already using it. And so you'd prefer that they're using it within the confines of your organization because to your point, you know, do you want all that stuff out there on the big wide world web, you know? So you'd prefer that it's within your constraints and that you can control that. So even if you decide as an organization to kick the bucket down a little bit before you embrace it, at least you're in front of it. But you can't ignore it. It is here, it's already here, and people are already using it. Yeah, that's such a great point. I've, I've heard AI attributed and talked about in the context of, gosh, do you remember the days of cloud? And the cloud was there. Remember how we used to figure out how to learn how to do search engines. Just understanding how to use a search engine correctly. AI is just evolving in so many different facets in so many different ways. Ryan, when you talk about AI and you talk about some of the design aspects and what you're gonna be able to do and see, have you guys started using AI to leverage some more insights into like the future view of work and maybe what something can look like as you design new elements for work? Yeah, I mean, it's been years. We, we built a layer upon Autodesk's generative design platform to help create better spaces in 2016. Uh, we were working with sensor data uh, around workspace utilization starting in 2008. Um, AI is changing the, like, if you ever deal with facilities managers or real estate people, AI is changing their world. They won't necessarily know it. I mean, we should be frank in that this crowd understands AI and its applications. But if you talk to the average person, you're like, are you using AI right now? Unless they're using a large language model like ChatGPT, they're going to be like, I don't know. Am I? Um, like, the difference between machine learning and generative design and neural networks, or whatever, that's lost on most people. And so if I look at our audiences, like the people who manage physical spaces, they're not typically on the cutting edge of technology. <laughs> like you are, I don't want to stereotype a little bit, but if I look at how AI is changing the whole world of physical environments, the buildings are getting smarter. I mean, there's really good data around being more energy efficient, about helping to make spaces safer. Um, there's tools to help design space better, like the ones I mentioned. Um, and there's also platforms coming out that help people to book, navigate, right. use space. This is a category of tech often known as prop tech or property tech that has been developing for a really long time. It's difficult for me to say, kind of like with cloud, when did it become AI? Because I think somebody got creative with the naming. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I think our physical environments, because organizations spend so much money on particularly corporate real estate, yeah. talking about a trillion dollar asset class, that if the AI can use uh, technology to help create the space better, manage the space better, help people have better experiences, there's a ton of money there. Yeah. It, a ton. Hence Microsoft the... places. Right. <laughs> right? Well, many yeah. organizations, corporate real estate is their number one expense. Yeah, number one or number two, typically yeah. right after people. Yep. Yep. Yes. And the most crudely measured. If you ask somebody, mm -hmm. tell me about the success metrics of your workplace, they're going to say, well, 212 people bad swiped in the front door. We don't know how long they stayed because they don't swipe out. I mean, that's how crudely this incredible investment's been measured. So these data sets are really helpful. We're seeing people trying to understand sentiment a little bit, like did the space actually help you? Uh, is, it, is it supporting your team? Um, there is a ton of opportunity here. Yeah, I love the conversation around data 
analytics and data analysis. In the past, we typically would have all this badge data. We would have data from invites, and we would try to correlate that data, and after a month or two, we'd be able to see what we did three months ago. And I think now, with modern work and some of the tools and the advancements in technology, mm -hmm. the ability to have that data in real time, to action off it in real time, is gonna help organizations not only move faster, but I think be more accurate, more nimble, be able to create environments that are conducive to people because they'll be able to see things in real time. Are my in a sunny spot? Is it too warm? Is it too cold? Why did they go to those areas? So those tools are here today, not only in the experience that we get from balancing people from home and the office or wherever they're working, not necessarily even home, just away from the workplace they're still working. But those, that information that's available, and that's where technology is actually getting better too because they're starting to build a lot of those tools and that information in there that are more relevant real time. So it's available to us very easily. So Ryan, back to you. I want to question when you, when you get a chance to start working with an organization. So there's many in the audience here that are probably in the middle or maybe advanced paths. They're kind of modern work strategies balancing where they're gonna be as an organization, you get a chance to really work with the executive leadership. And oftentimes the executive leadership, there might be a little friction, shall we say, because they have a, a different mindset. What really are some of the tools that you've used to kind of help remediate or mitigate some of that friction to help organizations see past a desire that they want today but really give them more of a look in the future. Are you referring to friction between executives with other executives or with their employees? I would think more of the friction between the executives and the knowledge workers. This yeah. balance of they're desirous to see something because of a real estate spend, but the reality of workforce engagement yep. and really creating an experience for our workforce. Because we're all about finding a great way to create an experience for our workforce that gives part of the draw of not only why they want to be back and how to create that community. It is people, I believe, that is one of the key elements, but there are so many other factors that go into it. How do you kick those conversations off? Yeah, well, th there's definitely been a lot of friction around where return to office mandates have backfired in a lot of organizations because even though the vast majority of employees, 85%, say they want to spend time every week in the office, when we're told we have to do something, there's a psychological theory called reactance theory. If I tell you you need to do something and you perceive it as a loss of freedom, I can expect you to do the opposite. So anything that has mandate behind it typically results in opposite. So th th we've had to overcome some of that. Um, we do this a lot of different ways. I'm just gonna give a shout out to our Detroit team as well as our dealer partners and some of the strategists on my team. The best scenario is you get in front of a group, maybe it's corporate real estate, IT leader, HR, and just have a conversation about what kind of work needs to be better supported. Like if you just try to think through the activities that your people do in the course of a week, where do you know there's disconnects? One of the questions we love to ask is, and we'll ask it to a specific team leader, who are the other teams you know you should be working more closely with, but you're just not? Um, these sort of things come up all the time. It redirects everyone around like the work. The work can be better. The technology can support better workflows. The space can support better workflows. There's some things that people um, can do really effectively from home. E email's one of them, by and large. Uh, but beyond that, it's interesting. It's kind of organizational specific. Sometimes it's group specific. We hear a lot of common things around, well, our team works fine digitally, like a small group of folks, like we can stay coordinated, but when it comes time to scale up what we're doing or interface with another group, we just feel super disconnected. I mean, that's a great reason to get people together, have more of those charrettes, workshops. Um, interestingly, we've heard an overwhelming amount of evidence that people are having a tough time concentrating and focusing. This has always been an issue in open offices, but 52% of the 34,000 people that have used our work from home tool, which is just wfh.hermanmiller.com, it's through our Herman Miller brand, 52% of people say their number one challenge at home is focus. And it could be a variety of reasons, it could be crappy Wi-Fi, it could be I got three little kids running around here, or dogs, or leaf blower, or whatever. Um, so 
it, when you start asking those questions, it's not like you can necessarily get everybody's input, although I have seen a few AI-enabled tools that literally allows almost everyone to provide that input, and you just have to come up with a couple scenarios. All right, we need to do a better job of these three things. Then the technology application, the furniture design, the interior design, you're aligned around something. It kind of like works past everybody's assumptions around, well, it's a meeting room. Well, I mean, a meeting room, like having 10 people meet for an hour, like, that's what Teams does really well, or that's what Zoom does really well. Like, what are we really trying to do here? Yeah, I like that. Trying to find that really good focus point um, and, and bring it back to why we're together. Uh, Peggy, you know, you talk about, you know, there's some great planning strategies and planning tools that kind of go along this line. Talk a little bit about um, the work that Magenium does to really start to build some of the planning structure along with everything that Ryan's talking about from a design aspect, design from lighting, temperature, environment, just that whole ecosystem. But where do you see that convergence with technology? How do you walk customers through the advancements in technology and balance that design aspect as well? Sure. Um, what you always have to be looking at is taking the beautiful spaces that are designed and that flow, but then how do you ensure that you're allowing your spaces to continually have that advanced technology? And so for most organizations, I mean, realistically, it's impossible almost to keep up with all of the new features that are rolling out. I mean, it is very different than how it was five years ago. So there'll be new features rolled out every month. Here's what's new, here's what's new. How do you keep up with that? Yeah, and so, you know, that's where, you know, if, you know, partnering with either, either you have to dedicate someone on your team, kind of like maybe not full time, but that's really looking at that, or you know you partner with someone that could help you with that and then we can you know guide you on that on these are the features that are rolling out or these are the things we're aware of under NDA that are going to be coming out you know long term but the key is that all of the technology and these new features that are rolling out will impact re in you in every way that you work so whether you're working you know, individually, or if you're working collaboratively with a team and in a space where you're all in that space together, you need to be aware of that or, and I mean, it's a task. Like, as people that are in charge of that workplace, the workspace, how do you stay in front of that? And that's what the challenge is right now. And it's planning for that and being aware of what these new technological advances are that are coming out. And they're fast and furious um, coming out for the rest of the year, we yeah, already know. It's the rapid acceleration of technology. Ryan, do you see the rapid acceleration also affecting designs and oh. is it, what do you guys see when we, originally you would, I'll put words in your mouth if I can, um, you know, you would design places that might have a longevity of seven, ten years. Now with technology rapidly changing, as Peggy mentioned, I think our new norm feels like three years. It, it's happening so quick. Is there any type of things that you're doing differently in room designs or helping customers try to recognize that too, that as technology changes, the room should also change a little bit too. Yes, yes and no. So I'll say that the biggest change that we've seen is not a new trend, it's the consumerization of IT. I mean, basically, consumer experience is set the benchmark now, so we see organizations investing in these amazing spaces, but if they're not immediately intuitive and natural for the people using them, they just walk past. And so it's just a new bar for like being intuitive. But the, what I see being most successful is when organizations demonstrate and encourage play. And so, I'll, let me back into a, a kind of a random story. Anybody ever heard of the mother of all demos? This was in 1968, one person. In 1968, Stanford showed the world the first personal computer. This is like, this is before we landed on the moon. And so, even though mainframes were still kind of new, and actually, if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, the women in that movie, their job title was computers. But Stanford was already on this idea of we're gonna have personal computers, and what they chose to do was like demonstrate it. And um, one of our brands, Herman Miller, 
worked with them to create this environment. If you can believe it, one of our designers who lived in Grand Haven designed the first mouse pad for the first mouse, the first monitor arm for the first monitor. But it gave people years to imagine, okay, I think I kind of get it. And then if I look more recently, the way people adopt technology is usually through play. This is the reason why dog fooding is so dangerous, because the people in this room are gonna be able to figure out the capabilities of technology very quickly. But like when we, like when we deployed Teams, I, put, I created a dummy team called Blackbriar because I love the Jason Bourne movies. I invited everybody to it. I put time on their calendars. You gotta go play in Blackbriar for at least three hours before we start using it. Post a GIF, create a document. You're not gonna screw anything up. And then at, after about two hours, everyone's like, I get it. I'm ready to use it. Yeah. But what I see today is um, these features are advancing quickly. Sometimes they're really easy for people to use, the Grammarly type, like intuitive. But there's more and more of our customers that are building out spaces where you can kind of get a sense of the new work environment, but where you can actually play with the technology without fear Love of screwing anything up. We just had this with a bank in Omaha, First National Bank of Omaha. They redid 24 floors in 2022. 2022, huge bet. They weren't really sure how people were working. They weren't really sure just how much they'd adopted Teams and other technologies. But they created, they called it a showroom, but it was really a playground. And it demonstrated the new sort of spatial layout. It had the new tools. Group after group got to come in and play. When they opened up that building, they had 70 plus percent occupancy in the first week, and it continues to that day. Wow. Because the people kind of got it. They were like, yeah. and if I'm being really frank, the workplace design wasn't drastically different than what I've seen elsewhere. It was the engagement. It was like, we're bringing you along. Like, yeah, we tested it but I'm not just gonna deploy it to your desktop. Like, go try this. And I think that demonstration and play is probably more important now than ever. I love that, I love that. That's, it's, that's so good, that opportunity to get reaction from people. So we've touched on a bunch today. I hope you found it valuable. Peggy, I wanna start with you as we kind of wrap this up. There's people here in many different states in their journey, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe some are just beginning. Again, some of you are maybe in the middle, some of you wrapping up. What's the one thing that you wanna share with those that are in this journey that's memorable for you that you would love to share as a lessons learned? Sure, um, and I'm gonna take it from the tech side, that's just cause that's uh, the, the world that I live in. Um, my number one thing is always just keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Now, even though I just said we have all these new features coming out, so there are all these great new things that you're all gonna get access to, but keep it simple. You just want it so that everything is kind of seamless. So if I'm working as an individual and then I go to collaborate and I go to my workspace and it's connected, that it's just easy for me to transition into that. So don't, if possible, try not to over design or over complicate it. Just keep it as simple as you can and the tech will take you there. I love that, thank you, Peggy. So Ryan, you've had so many experiences and you have such a wealth of knowledge. Let's leave the audience. How can you put a little wind in their sail oh. to encourage them on their journey? Wind coming. Um, well, what you do, I mean, I, and I say this sincerely, what you do is super important because you're helping people to stay connected. You're helping people to be productive, to achieve more. Work impacts our lives way more than financially. Like you're unlocking keys to allow people to achieve and have success, so it's really important. Um, I would just kind of like, for all of us, I would just say the most important thing we can do is just try to imagine people doing their work. And part, like in, in your case, if you're in an uh, IT or AV organization, getting with the real estate folks, the HR folks, and just asking the question, how do you think we need to help people work better? And forget about the space and the tech for a bit. Like, what do you think people need help with? The more user-centered we can be, the better. There, this technology company is not represented in this room, but I'll never forget going to a facility years ago to see like a brand new high-tech R&D um, effort by a, a major tech company. And we saw this technologically amazing demonstration and I asked the question, so what's it supposed to help people do? And the head of engineering said, our marketing team is working on that. And <laughs> I don't even get away with that anymore. Like we've got to start with what are people struggling with? How can the tech help? How can the space help? If we do that, we elevate our value in terms of the investment people are making in us, clear ROI, more importantly, we're helping people work better. I love that, I love that. I would just add to, um, you're not alone. 
you're not alone in your journey. Wherever, whatever stage you're in, whatever spot you're in, you're not alone. There's many organizations, there's many people that have maybe had the same experience, something similar. I like what Peggy said, keep it simple. I love what Ryan said, work and ask questions. I think my message would be, just jump in. Just jump in, get started somewhere. Race to good. Don't worry about getting to great, it will come in time. Mm -hmm.